Welcome to Season 4 of the Art of Teaching podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you joined me today. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you that have subscribed, listened and reviewed the episodes. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Today I have the great privilege of introducing you to the amazing Phil Roberts. He's an innovative school leader and educator with over 30 years of experience. Phil was a wonderful guest and we covered a range of topics including how and when to take calculated risks, why it's essential to have a life outside of work, and what this new era of principal leadership involves. In his own words, I'm not here to warm the chair, I'm here to make a difference. I hope that you get as much out of our discussion as I did. Please enjoy. Phil Roberts, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. I am thrilled uh, that you would speak to me. Thanks a lot, Matt. And I must tell you, I'm not only thrilled to be here, but um, also when I look at the uh, the people you've spoken to in the past, I feel really honoured to be part of that illustrious company. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we are phoning, uh, you're phoning in from your office, I presume, uh, from the school that you uh, currently are principal at. Um, I thought it was supposed to be school holidays. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, so uh, pr- school holidays are for children. And, yeah. And uh, the principals generally, I, I'm pretty sure most of us have a little easier time in the school holidays, but uh, I think that a lot of work needs to be done over that time that you structure well for the holidays. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's not possible to be home every day and expect to do the job well, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Um, quite possibly the most important question of our interview, what is your coffee order? Well, that's a really good question because I noticed that when you were asking other guests on your podcast and I don't drink coffee, but what I do drink is a Lapsang Souchong tea. I buy it by the kilogram and uh, my staff hate the smell of it. It smells like a zoo. Um, but I drink about eight mugs of Lapsang Souchong tea. It's a burnt tea. It's a very smoky flavour. Exactly. So um, that's my favourite drink, Matt. Okay. And, and what are uh, some of the reasons behind that? Have you, uh, I'm assuming it's a, a Chinese tea. Uh, have you, have you travelled in China? Did you come across it through a, a, a conference or how did you? Uh, no, I just have be, mainly been a tea drinker. Um, I don't go out of my way to avoid coffee, but I've mainly, I enjoy the, the different tastes of some teas. And yeah. um, this is a black tea. Um, it's a heavy tea. It's a strong, heavy flavour. And it's uh, Probably, I think tea is a very, very refreshing drink, so much more so than coffee. So, um, and it's got the antioxidants and everything else, Matt, so you might as well fill yourself up with a good cuppa. Absolutely. I mean, I I was born in England and I I, I grew up uh, drinking tea. Um, And so some of my fondest memories are some of those discussions uh, with my grandparents and with my parents around a lovely cup of tea. And it's so... (laughs) Uh, yeah, it, it, it's so diverse and it, it's wonderful to uh, uh, it, it's wonderful to see um, I, I mean it's wonderful I think to experience so many different types of tea so are you set on this particular one have you, have you yes yes I used to like my Russian caravan but it wasn't smoky enough and um, I actually order through a company in Tasmania called the art of tea and it oh. comes to me in kilogram bags would you believe they must think there's some sort of drug coming through the post you know, I'm surprised the sniffer dogs haven't sort of identified it because it's that strong. Wow. But, um, you know, I, I, I go through it a lot. And um, as I say, I think when you, quite honestly, when you're teaching throughout the day to have a, you know, you regulate, a lot of people have water and I drink that too, but a, a regular cups of tea keep me going. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, is there a, um, a book that you have recently read? It could be uh, in the, the realms of education or it could be beyond that has made you uh, stop and reconsider a few things. Yes, um, I would say I, I enjoy politics enormously, Matt, and I, mm-hmm. I enjoy um, reading political biographies and I've just read two biographies on Donald Trump. One was called A Very Stable Genius and I Alone Can Fix It. These are the Washington Post journalists, Ruckett and Leonig. And um, they made me reflect 
very much on the fragility of our democracies. Wow. And um, he, uh, you know, in my view, he was a truly repugnant human being and an appalling leader. And I think, you know, uh, we often need to remind ourselves that leadership must exemplify many of the same qualities, whether you are running a country or you're running a school. Mm. There are certain personal attributes and qualities that you should possess and bring to the fore. And yes. um, I think he la he was so lacking in those qualities um, that the books are truly insightful and it's a front row seat into the anarchy and chaos that uh, characterised his leadership. Yeah, wow, fascinating. Um, do you think it's important to uh, to read extensively outside of your area of expertise? I mean, do you, I can, obviously, uh, leadership, uh, the book that you've just uh, quoted before is obviously related to your role uh, as a school principal, but do you think it's important to to read other things as well and seek a variety of opinions? Yeah, very much so, Matt. I, I really think that, uh, you know, don't narrow your horizons. I think you, you need to have a breadth and depth in this role. Yeah. Um, you need to be able to, as leaders, we are community leaders. We're in contact with many people from many mm -hmm. diverse backgrounds. And I think it's um, really important and it's more enriching when you can have conversations about a, a, a multitude of issues. And I think, um, you know, that's the way the perspective I come from. I don't limit myself. I'm a huge podcaster. I listen to, because I my drive is a probably... 50 minutes to get home and to get here every day. I live in the Northern Beaches and I listen to my favourite podcasts. And let me tell you, you're part of that. Oh, um, thank you so much. So, you know, but I listen to a whole range of different um, perspectives and views from politics to uh, crime, you name it. Fantastic. Do you think, Phil, that the, uh, that the notion of leadership uh, has changed or is changing over the years? Yes, I, I think that leadership has transformed and there are different notions of leadership now. And even when I came into there, you can still see, and I can still see this reflected in some um, people who may comment on LinkedIn, that, that idea of the great man leadership, you mm. know, the, the strong sort of, the, the sort of Trumpian approach to leadership. Um, in the education setting, I think we've you know, we've had the transformative leadership, the distributed leadership, and we're very much in an era and the importance of the educational leadership. Yeah. You know, and the principal who used to be quite detached from that notion that principal was perceived as a bit of a manager. And now I think the principal is a leader of educational change, needs to be a, a leader of educational change. Um, and I, I, so I think there has been those iterations that we've seen come through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we've necessarily discarded some of those notions. I still think distributed, transformative, you know, I mean, I, I really enjoy transformation, but um, I also enjoy the idea of leading, leading education and leading educational change in the school. I think that's really important um, because education is, is so full of fads and trends and we have to have someone, uh, a group of us, leadership team who understands empirical evidence yeah. and how to lead education in, in a in a very um authentic way yeah it it's it seems like a really curious role uh, that of the principal as well because obviously you um get into the role because of your skills and expertise within the classroom but once you sit in the principal seat it's a different um a set of skills from your tool belt i mean you're now managing you're in charge of uh, fiscal responsibility staffing hr um, a community engagement and also being a leader um, of curriculum and implementation. Uh, do you think people have a um, people that are not in the role have a an accurate understanding of what's involved in leading in uh, leading a school and being a principal? No, they don't, Matt. Not even my wife does. 
Um, <laughs> you know, it's remarkable. I yeah. spent, I, you know, I, I came into it like I've been 20 years as a principal. Wow. And I remember very clearly my first four years, they were really like walking in fog. Um, I, it took me a while to clearly understand the full import of this role, its complexity, um, what was involved, and you named some of those aspects, you know, the human resource mm -hmm. management side of things. And, um, you know, over time, I've not only learned to appreciate the complexity of the role, but learned to understand just how important that role is, mm. how you are seen by others, your colleagues most particularly, um, what it means to them to have someone who can lead with integrity, um, with vision and courage. Um, yeah. I, I do believe in, in that sort of maxim that came from Keating, Paul Keating. Mm. Um, again, one of the, my you know, favourite prime ministers, you know, he said that leadership is about courage and vision. Yeah. And I think it's very true in a principal's role. You've got to articulate a vision well and clearly to your community and to your team and explain the rationale for that. But you've yeah. also got to have the courage to make some very difficult decisions and see yeah. it through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 20 years in anything is a long time. Um, but how do you how do you stay so passionate and so um, excited to come to work um, in your role? Because like I think with, when you think about principal turnover and challenges and complexity and burnout and all of those other things, uh, why do you think you're still uh, sitting in that chair and as passionate as you've always been about leading a school? Uh, uh, to a few, a few reasons, perhaps, Matt. Um, one is I have a very supportive board um, and I know that it is true. It's very rare to find someone who's mm -hmm. 20 years as principal. I, I see the turnover and I have seen the turnover. Um, but we have a, a very unique culture at Mount Sinai College. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the features has been, defining features has been having a board of management that know the lines of demarcation. They don't get into operational. They are strictly there for strategic and they trust. They trust your judgment. They trust what I do in the sphere of education. And I don't get involved in that. And mm. that makes leadership and the role of and the interaction I have with my board an absolute pleasure. Wow. Um, so that's from an independent school's perspective. Secondly, I think you have to have interests outside of your role. And that goes without saying. Um, I have only gave up soccer football three years ago. I, I was fortunate enough to play for 50 years without injury. And um, also for about 30 years, I've been a very keen cyclist and I, I do a lot of cycling and um, spend a lot of money on my bike and my gear. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that keeps me yeah. very fit. And I say that because I mm. honestly don't believe you can do this job unless you have a healthy mind, body and spirit. Yeah, and I think so. Yeah. You know, I enjoy that. The spiritual side, if you like, I mean, yeah. I am in a faith based school. Um, I enjoy what the, the challenge of um, the intellectual rigor of a faith based school. Um, our, in our school, we're a Jewish school, and um, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy working with my colleagues, Great. Um, most of whom are Jewish. And uh, you know, we often, we often say you get two Jews in a room, you'll get four opinions. And um, it's wonderful, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of polemicism that goes on here. Yeah. Um, but it's great. It's very dynamic. And it's also a very different school of style of leadership. You know, it's, uh, it's very non hierarchical, generally in Jewish schools, we don't yeah. have a, uh, a hierarchy, as such, we have an open door policy, you have parents and staff walking in. Um, and that emanates from the religion itself. Yeah, wow. it's been a very grassroots religion. Um, and it's without the formal, both architectural structures, um, you know, the, the roots of the religion began more in a market area, a marketplace. So mm. it, you can see the way in which um, over time, and I've been here longer than the 20 years as principal, because I was a deputy and also a teacher here. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a school that um, I can fit into. Mm. And I say that cautiously because I'm not sure that if I move to another educational setting or school 
I would necessarily be as effective or the same person I am now. Wow. Wow. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for your, for your honesty. And we, we talked about some of the, um, uh, some of the challenges and some of the uh, complexities with your role, but what are some of the things that you uh, absolutely love about your job? What are some of the reasons that, that get you up in the morning, morning and excited to come through the doors? Working with my colleagues. Right. Um, I really love teaching. I always have loved teaching. Um, and I enjoy uh, at my stage and age working with the team. I, you know, I, I don't stand apart from them. I stand with them. And I enjoy helping them to become the best people they can be in that classroom. Mm. You know, I'm aware of the research. I'm aware of what constitutes great teaching and a great teacher. Um, you know, I read in this area profusely um, and listen to these people on your podcast. You know, all of these people, Dinham and Hattie and all of those people who have had a, a major impact on me and my thinking. And I've been to seminars and heard them all. And I enjoy imparting that knowledge to my colleagues. That's awesome. um, it goes without saying that I enjoy working with children, even yeah. though that's a part of the job that's become harder over the yeah. years. I still enjoy working with kids. They're, they're hilarious. And, um, you know, if you, I like to get a laugh with the kids every day. And when I was a teacher, I, I really did enjoy being in the class. Teaching's a bit performative, Matt. Yeah. You close that door a bit metaphorically these days because we don't sort of have we have glass everywhere. You, but you sort of get inside, and it's a bit performative. You you can become a bit of a goose, and you can you can really let let the the other part of you come out, you know. And um, I really enjoyed that when I was teaching. Fantastic, that's it's really wonderful to hear. And I think when you um, it was for those people, obviously we're recording in audio, so you can't see the video, but it was great to see. Uh, Phil getting really excited when he was talking about uh, talking about working with children. It's so lovely to see, uh, Phil, that even after 20 plus years, you're excited about seeing kids learn and grow and develop. It's it's really refreshing because I think there's too many people in this profession that used to really care and used to be relevant. Um, but it's so lovely to see that it doesn't have to be that way and that you can be continue to be really passionate. So, so thank you. It doesn't matter. And I, I, I just say uh, something to not so much to digress, but I, I think we have a profession. We have to recognize that we don't always have the quality we're looking for. Mm. Now, there are a number of reasons for that yeah. in the teaching profession. We, we can often be a little bit too self-congratulatory and often be not examine um, the practices going on in the profession and the people in it. And we yeah. don't always have a great people in the profession. You know, we've got to have the the courage to weed them out. Mm. Um, I think, you know, they, they not only do damage to the profession, but they don't really um, do a lot for children. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that's, you know, something I've never lost is that passion yeah. of working for kids, working for my colleagues and with them. And you, you may have um, already touched on this uh, question, Phil, but how do you make sure that you're maintaining that uh, balance between um, uh, understanding and, and displaying relevant teaching pedagogy, but also exemplary leadership. Because I think one of the challenges that, that I find uh, being both in a classroom and in a leadership role is that sometimes you feel like you're, you've got one foot in both camps. And I know for me, sometimes I feel like a great educator one day and uh, not such a great teacher, not such a great leader. And other days when I feel like my leadership game is strong, um, I feel like I may have dropped the ball in some way with my classroom so how do you how do you maintain that balance and is it always such a lovely tension or to some some days you get it right and others you don't it may be a little bit more uh prevalent in your circumstance matt and i can understand why i think fundamentally i am the leader more yeah. than i and i do have um a role to play in shaping the the education and what we do in the school, of course, that's important, but I come at it from, if you like the, the eight sort perspectives, you know, the, if you look at the standards for principles there, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty damn good, you know, yeah, um, true. leading teaching and learning and uh, all the others, you know, developing self and others and leading improvement and innovation and change, mm -hmm. all of those aspects. I'm fundamentally um, coming from that perspective right. every day. Um, you know, that's, that's the way I see my role. 
Um, I don't interfere with my staff in the classroom. I accept the fact that you have to, at some point, trust their judgment and allow their own creativity to come to the fore. What we tend to do, though, is have conversations around what constitutes excellence uh, in, in this profession, what constitutes best practice, examine the fads and the trends. I know one of your previous uh, podcasts, I think um, Steve Dinan was talking about this, you know, um, we're a profession that has, we have to be very aware mm. of what is not efficacious, mm. you know, what, what doesn't work. Yeah. And I enjoy that challenge of bringing to my colleagues the articles, um, the readings, you know, the, the intellectual rigour that this profession demands. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, Phil, do you think there's a difference between uh, management and leadership? Um, yes, there is. That's and something I, that has come up in a number of discussions I've been having. I'd just be interested to hear. So that question was not on the questions I sent to you, but I thought, no, it's, while it's, you're here, yeah, it, it's it's one that we have spoken about in the past, and I think unfortunately you probably will find there are some principals who are fundamentally managers, mm. and they are people who are the the desk jockeys, and that perhaps they they see their role as one of answering emails most of the day. Um, you know, they are, remain fairly aloof and detached from the operational side of things. They delegate a lot to others, don't take responsibility, don't articulate a, really, um, a vision and probably lack the courage to make those decisions, you know, because mm. it's all delegable. Um, that's a managerial role. It's not to say that there aren't aspects of this job that you have to manage. Yeah. Uh, some of which are incredibly painful, by the way. I mean, anyone, any principal is, who has, has to manage NAPLAN will tell you that that is, you know, it, it almost brings a, a, gr a grown man to tears, <laughs> you know, managing that process um, from an independent school's point of view. So that's management, but you have to do it. There are aspects of this job that are management. Yeah, it's, re it's really interesting because I think um, one, of, one of the trends that I'm uh, noticing is um, sort of that shift from the management and the administration of a school really to more of that uh, uh, transformational leadership and more of that uh, leadership which actually empowers others but the thing that I'm trying to get my head around is you obviously require a lot of trust to be able to let people let the professionals let the people that are in the classroom do their job um, is that is that difficult is that um, is that a hard thing to do as a leader uh, to allow people to be able to do their job and to check in and how do you ensure that um, standards are maintained and that there's consistency of implementation and how on earth do you do that because it it strikes me as it would it would be a lot easier to tell people what to do um, and uh, micromanage them uh, obviously that's not as effective um, but how do you create a, a, a culture in your school where um, where people are actually empowered to do their job. Sorry, that was an incredibly long question. Very That's a great question. I, I get it. No, it's 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 a we have a culture here of mentorship. So we have it's quite natural here for my leaders and for others to walk into the classroom and to observe practice and then afterwards to talk about the practice. Now you, you you're looking at student learning when you're going in there. Yeah, wow. You're seeing what is happening in student learning. But having those great conversations is part of the natural um, operational landscape here. Absolutely. So I think that, you know, we have a beautifully designed school. Um, it, in fact, it's won an award. We, we turned yeah. what was a pig's ear into a, into a you know, a silk purse. It, it's a, it was a dog of a school, if I don't mind saying myself, you know, um, mm -hmm. it was old fashioned. We have glass everywhere. You, you really can't hide in this school and it's um, open walls between the grades. So you work with your colleague a lot of the day. So it's a very, it's an environment that is not allowing the individual to go inside to a square box and close a door for the rest of the day. Yeah. It's an environment that encourages discourse encourages an examination of practice encourages the um, examination of student learning mm. you know um, I have been incredibly involved on so many committees and um, other leadership roles external to the school 
um, as have some of my colleagues, and we run a very proficient um, program for our proficient teachers or highly accomplished or lead or um, experienced teachers. So, you know, once you've got your systems in place, Matt, once mm. you've got those critical systems in place, you can you can manage your school in the way that it should be managed. Fantastic. Yeah, that's really lovely. Uh, how, how important is having a wonderful um, school environment, in your opinion? I mean, obviously, the um, Professor John Hattie talks about the role of the teacher and that being the most significant factor. Um, but obviously, uh, how important are environmental considerations when you're thinking about creating learning environments that students want to be engaged in? We, we both know, and anyone listening to this will both know that the most important single determinant in student outcome is that person in front of the room. But there's nothing like um, beautiful architecture to inspire people. You know, we, we are a, a, a society, a country that always admires the beauty uh, in so much, whether it be architecture, cars, you name it. And I think the notion that we can keep renovating our homes, buying our new cars and appreciating the inherent beauty of design, but somehow keep children into mountable boxes um, and expect to get the best out of people doesn't quite equate to me. You know, they architecture has uh, sort of been defined, if you like, as frozen music. And, you know, the idea here is to, to get the orchestra playing, you have to have these individuals work in that design, you know. Um, we make the buildings and afterwards they make us, Churchill said, you know, and I think there's so much truth in that, seeing the teachers, when you've got a school that professes to, we're an Apple Distinguished School, and an Apple Distinguished School is a school that relies upon its um, personalization of learning to an extent. Um, when you create the nooks and crannies as, as Anne Shaw's work, you know, the water holes, caves and campfires, when you create that ability in architecture, it's inspiring for the teachers. And when we finally moved into the new spaces, you could see the change it made in the teachers. They moved from dark boxes to light um, inspirational spaces, which yeah. allowed them to execute the profession in ways that is more contemporary. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for those people that are not aware, um, would you mind just talking briefly about some of the awards that you've won uh, for your school environment? Because uh, it's it's really quite impressive. Yeah, we have, um, I have to look at this one, Matt. We, okay. um, we have... Um, the, New, the Learning Environment Award, New South Wales chapter, we're a winner in the um, over $5 million category. And, um, you know, that uh, that's a very interesting process, actually, Matt, because we met the architects uh, in 2014. And, um, you know, the architects were able to reflect Jewish iconography in the design and the architecture of the school, albeit very subtly. And I think that really um, lifted the tone and tenor of this school immeasurably. Um, it's beautifully done. Um, and you can see it on our website. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inspirational sort of design. Sorry, Phil, I just had someone try to get into our house. I think it was a delivery. My apologies. That's the, uh, the joys of uh, internet. Never a problem, Matt. Never a problem. Always, uh, always interesting. But I mean, that's that's so impressive. I mean, I was I was looking at a. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on uh, on uh, Ted. There's a circular kindergarten uh, in Japan, which is really really interesting. Uh, somebody who I would uh, love to interview on the podcast. And uh, basically, the designer created a circular kindergarten so that if children felt like they could run away, they would obviously come back to the beginning. Um, and so kids really couldn't escape. But it's really wonderful. And it was the one of the first um, uh, one of the first aspects of school design that I really looked at and thought, wow, like this really does make a difference. I mean, where we're sending our children, the learning, the environments in which they learn and engage in, it really does have an impact on student learning. And I think it's it's so wonderful to, to hear about your transformation from, um, from a school, in, in your own words, that wasn't as uh, idea, uh, wasn't as uh, inspirational as maybe um, 
you, your current spot is, but it's so lovely to see that you've really invested that time and that energy and that money uh, into making sure that um, the learning environment is one that students really want to go uh, to and engage in. So it's yes. really it's really exciting to see. And even that the idea of having open classrooms and glass, I think is really, really important. Um, just so students feel or teachers know that they're, um, it's very much uh, a very collaborative in nature, which is really, really wonderful. Um, they say, Matt, that um, a design isn't finished until someone is using it. And, you know, it, you, you need to put the bodies in there and see how, um, how it is used. And it's just so inspirational when you see that. Yeah, really. It's really, really great. Um, I feel I'm just curious, where do you think... Um, education is heading to in the next 10 to 15 years I, I know that COVID has really um, from my point of view really uh, made us answer some really important questions about um, about the purpose of education and also the uh, the role of schools so in your opinion uh, what sort of trends do you see happening? Um, some positive ones I, I actually think that a lot of the work that um, Nessa is doing is very good um, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of the work that Aitzel and Nessa is doing is very positive. And, um, you know, I, I really think in terms of teacher accreditation, um, recognition of higher levels, it's actually bringing a sharper focus on the profession. Um, and I, I, I wish on the negative side, I, I would like to see the profession... Uh, or I'd like to see politicians get out of it. Um, it's a little bit too politicised. Um, you know, you've got the federal sphere and the, and the state sphere. And, um, you know, there's... I would love to see a, a little bit less of that sort of, you know, politicisation of education. And I think what's ha what, what happens there is you end up getting not enough leadway and not enough time to implement the changes you need to because so often the politicians are um, demanding some sort of change, you know, depending mm -hmm. on who's coming to government. Now, it never used to be like that or it never was as obvious as that. Um, and I think that has a deleterious impact on the profession. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to have to grapple with is the... We all understand that there's going to be change, but it's the pace of change, which I think is becoming more difficult for teachers. You know, that it, the rapid pace of change is, is something that is, um, and that's often brought on by technology and other factors external to the schools, external to education itself. Yeah, wow. You, know, um, you, could, you, you alluded to one thing. I mean, COVID itself has, has transformed a lot. Um, so I, I see it you know, in some positive sense. I, I see some things happening there which are, are good um, and still some areas there which concern me. I think we have to be very awake to the fads and the trends. Um, you know, we have to be guided by really good empirical research. Yeah. Um, those are the things that preoccupy me. Yeah. And how uh, how is your school community uh, going, Phil, after a, a pretty interrupted year? Um, how do you, um, what have you had to do as a leader and a community, um, someone who is so involved in your community to make sure that everyone is okay and being looked after? Offer hope. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, it's so interesting. True. Yeah, it, it's interesting, Matt. You, you've got to, when you, when you become a principal, you understand your position in the community as much as anything else. I'm not by nature um, an optimistic person, actually, uh, but I am a person who holds out hope. And I think there's a difference there. Hope is something that you actually, uh, as a community, you work at and you, you aim towards a, an outcome, optimism, cast your fate to the wind a little bit you know but uh i think you have to offer your community some hope and um our staff have just done the most amazing job you know uh they have really uh, you would expect it in a school like this that prides itself on its use of technology yeah. as an apple distinguished school but mm -hmm. uh we have done a very good job um of managing this lockdown 
But having said that, we are mindful, all of us, of the fact that many families are finding it very hard and yeah. many children have found it very hard. Yeah. You know, these days, when I came into education, that there was no word like well-being. We didn't even give consideration <laughs> to, or there wasn't a lot of consideration given to well-being. And perhaps to some extent, we didn't have the issues yeah. then that we have now. So we are so acutely aware now of um, ensuring the well-being of our students. And I think some of those kids have found it very hard at home in yeah. lockdown. Yeah. So that, that's an issue for many of us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's, um, it, it's so interesting seeing the, um, seeing the type of year that we have had, especially as a result of COVID and seeing how our school communities have adapted. We obviously work in two very different uh, communities. I'm uh, in the government sector, you're in the independent sector. But I think there are definitely some of those commonalities in terms of um, uh, some of those issues of well-being with students and, and, and how families are connecting with school. I think one of the wonderful things that I've noticed is just how important the roles of schools are in terms of community engagement. Um, they really do form that if you like that tapestry uh, within communities. And so uh, for me, it was a really nice reminder of um, the role that schools play. And also it's actually been quite refreshing, refreshing for me because I've managed to get back to the basics, if you like, of my only job has been to lead a team and also to, um, uh, to engage with my class, which has been really wonderful because we're at a point where all school events are canceled. And so it's just me, the phone, the internet, talking to kids, which is really lovely. And so in many ways, it's been uh, quite refreshing to go back to basics. I'm not sure if you feel the same way. Hey, I, I can well imagine. I think that we have become, our curriculum has become so cluttered. Yeah. And for you to get the time with your kids, because what we all want to do is to build a great rapport with our kids, don't we? Yeah. You know, it's often said, if you can't reach them, you can't teach them. Yeah. And I think sometimes the cluttered curriculum yeah. and the frenetic pace makes it very difficult to build the strong connections that you require. Yeah, absolutely. and particularly for the little kids. Um, yeah. So yes, there's a lot of what you said there, which I really understand yeah. and um, I totally agree with. There's been a, a calming influence um, I've seen um, in this time, which has been pleasant. Um, I must say it hasn't been you know I was saying earlier on what has surprised me is my own ability to attend to meetings to conversations mm. to readings with a far greater level of focus yeah and I think that it told me something about how I had lost some of that in the frenetic pace of a principal's day yeah, wow. Well. You, know, you you have to jump around from, you know, this is this is why the the Ross's work on the third space is so important. You've got to yeah. find that that point at which you need to slow down and find your own center, if you like. Mm. Um, because quite often you don't realize what's happening. You're on a phone call, you're dealing with a, some teacher issues, you might have student behavioral issues. You know, you're back to another phone call, you've got another meeting and you, you can't in a day like that always attend yeah. fully to what has been said and done. Yeah. So the, the slower pace at which we are working at the moment has made me realise that I've got so much more attentiveness to the conversation. And yeah. um, I think that is that will be an important message for everyone who's listening to this podcast, by the yeah. way, not just me. Any leader will find the same thing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just curious, Phil, how, um, how do you stay present when you're dealing with these things? Because um, one of the things that I've found particularly challenging with the role is, as you mentioned before, they're, they're constantly, they're constantly interact, uh, interruptions, things like answering emails and planning curriculum and meeting with teams and deciding which fires to be putting out and what direction to go. How do you, um, how do you make sure that when you are with somebody that you are really in the moment? I, I was on a call last week with uh, Jane Burns, Professor Jane Burns, and she had a little what she calls a bento box for well-being. And I, what I really liked about her, because I think there's a lot of rubbish going on, by the way, in well-being. I think it's become an industry. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of stupid things are done in the name of well-being. But what I loved about her 
bento box was returning to some basics, mm. really good sleep. And if I just digress for one moment, if when I say that I read a book which had a profound impact on me, and that was Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Yeah. If anyone wants to understand just how important sleep is to our functioning, you need to read that. Um, good diet, good exercise, you know, good friendships, finding your purpose in life. I mean, mm -hmm. often principals and teachers have it because that's the calling of the job. Yeah. But I think so many people don't have a sense, a centered meaning or purpose to what they're doing. Yeah. Now, I feel very pleased in life that I've got all of that, you know, that there is nothing that I look at in my life and think, oh, gee, I'm deficient or, you know, there's something that I don't really have burdens or worries i've got two adult children they're doing very well you know i've still got a lovely wife and um as i said to you before i've got my exercise routine it's very yeah. important to me um you know and uh also don't believe that as principal and i saw recently someone had posted on linkedin uh a principal's diaries day you know starting at what a six o'clock and going through till 10 o'clock at night that sort of stuff is rubbish in yeah. my view. I'm not I, I'm not um impressed by that stuff. No, no, this sort of stuff if if you if you think that that's is somehow impressive, you've mm. got the wrong notion. You are you you won't last long at all. Yeah. You're going to burn out yourself. You're yeah. going to be an annoyance to your colleagues. <laughs> you have to find a way to look after yourself. And I have found that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's so important to, uh, for somebody like me uh, who aspires to, um, to continue, obviously, their career in education, to see that it doesn't have to be, I mean, you don't have to do all this uh, at the sacrifice of, of things that are really important to you. And, and for me, um, I know the things that I wouldn't be able to handle this level of complexity that I currently have in my first year of teaching. It would have just crushed me and so it's really it's really wonderful and really important I think for people um, at my stage in career in their career um, to see people like you that are um, that are committed to finding out how to do it well um, and to do it in a way that doesn't tread all over people doesn't destroy people doesn't destroy a school culture but you can actually do it um, there is a way to do it so I, I'm so grateful for your um, for your example here I think it's really important and can I just say Matt I had a um you know, we're in the Jewish schools in Sydney, we are close, all of us. And I had a, a colleague, she was a, um, a wonderful person and a great leader, but she also worked a, you know, she, she was an incredibly hard worker, but I also think um, a micromanager. Mm. Anyway, she was on the cusp of retirement and then, you know, was very ill and passed away. You know, no one's going to look back and say, wasn't she fantastic? You know, she was still answering emails at 11 o'clock at night. This sort of stuff is rubbish and it's got to stop. Yeah. You're killing people in the profession. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really think that good leaders know how to balance it. And I would implore you, urge you, and I'm pleased to hear you say, don't get sucked into that vortex. Know your limitations, but yeah. also know your lines of demarcation. Yeah. You turn around and you say to people, no, I'm not going to be, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be doing that. Yeah, this is my family's important to me or my my what I'm doing on the weekend is important to me. And I'm not going to sacrifice that. Yeah. You become a better principal for it. Yeah. That's what people don't get. The yeah. idea of, you know, I'll get up at five in the morning and I'll go to bed at 11 at night. And I'm going to be working all the way through. You know, I don't know who you're trying to impress, but it's certainly uh, uh, the greatest deterrent to bringing yeah. good people into this profession yeah. as leaders, if that's how you think leadership should be exemplified absolutely and i'm so grateful that that is slowly changing um, yes because i know when i started uh, teaching gosh almost 16 years ago now um i think that in some ways that was kind of idealized um and i'm glad to see that it is changing because yes um, it just it's just not sustainable and to be perfectly honest the only reason why i can commit so much to my my job and my class and my and, and my students is because I have a great life outside of school. Um, yes. And I know for me, that is the thing that in many ways fuels uh, what I get to do professionally. So it, it's really it's really grateful to hear you talking so honestly about that and, and, and thank you. Um, do you think that 
Do you ever get caught up though in that comparison? I mean, you're obviously, uh, you would get to rub shoulders with some pretty incredible educators, but do you ever go, oh, I should be doing that. I should be, you know what I mean? We should be really pursuing these things or how important is it as a principal uh, to be able to see um, uh, clearly and know exactly uh, what you're meant to do or uh, what you're called to do as an individual? How important is it to know those things and not get caught up in the, in the cycles of uh, comparison? Um, well, first of all, you, you know, let me answer it this way, Matt. You know, what I love most about this job is what I love about traveling is yeah. learning. Yeah. Um, to this day, what excites me is learning. Mm. And if I can learn from my colleagues, if I can see the deficits here at my school yeah. that could be overcome by adopting something else that a colleague has done, then I'm going to do it. Mm. it would be the greatest compliment to my colleague to say, hey, what you've done is so good, I'm going to bring it into my school. Yeah. Um, I, I don't feel any sense of um, deficiency when I look across the... I, I think schools are so unique. Each one has a unique culture. Yeah. And, you know, we, we want to learn from each other as much as we can. That's why, as I was saying to you before, I like to... Um, go and have a coffee with a couple of my colleagues on a regular basis. I like to learn from them. I like to mm. see what what inspires me about them. Yeah. You know, so no, I, 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 I find quite the opposite. Actually, I find what I get out of my uh, collegiality and through my membership of principals associations is learning from others. And if I stop learning and the day I stop learning is the day I turn around and say, OK, look, I think I've now had enough as a principal. Yeah, wow. Yeah, wow. That's really, it's really great to see that uh, just as much as we encourage our students to be lifelong learners, we must continue to do that because essentially we are just older kids uh, that uh, that should continue that have that thirst and that passion for learning. So thank you for embodying that. I think it's really, uh, really, really important. Um, Phil, are you... Um, are you optimistic? Uh, we've talked a lot of, sorry, you have to be, you're a principal of a flourishing school, but we've talked a lot about the importance of uh, a balance and this ability to uh, create these thriving school cultures. And are you optimistic that we can do that? Or do you think there's, uh, is it a bit more complicated than that? Do you think we- Yeah, I, I think- I, is changing? I, I actually gonna start this response in this way that, um, what influenced me was uh, reading about the Stockdale paradox. Yes. Now, for those for those of people who don't know that, and very few people will, it was that came from Vice Admiral Admiral Stockdale. Um, he was one of the highest ranking U.S. military officials um, in the Hanoi Hilton. He was a prisoner of war um, in Vietnam, and he was tortured more than twenty times during his eight years of imprisonment. Um, and what he found is that there were, with, with the other um, interns who were similarly tortured, he found that many of them would hold out hope that they were going to be released at some point of time. And he survived, the others didn't. And the Stockdale principle goes something like this. It's, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. Wow. Now, it's not that there are brutal facts in the school, but I think you have to be very, very realistic about your challenges. Yeah, wow. Incredibly realistic. I don't think you can be pollyanna -ish. You know, I was saying before, Optimism is the belief that things will get better. Hope is the belief that if we work hard enough together, we can make things better. And it needs no courage to be optimistic, but it needs courage, wisdom, and a deep understanding of history and possibility to wow. be a prophet of hope. Yeah. So to answer your question, I have a lot of hope. Great. I But... I'll be very honest with you. I don't. I'm not an optimistic person. <laughs> <laughs> I am I'm probably very more on the side of a pessimistic person. But then pessimists are the ones who are motivated to change and do things. Right. And, and I adhere to that Stockdale principle. I think it's really you know don't lose faith that you'll prevail, but be honest about confronting the challenges. 
the real challenges that are here. Yeah, uh, Phil, that's, that's such a, that's su- I remember reading that many years ago and just going, ah, oh, okay. So it's not about being this blindly, this sort of faith-filled person with that, that have, has no sort of grasp on reality. But it's actually about yeah. putting those to intention. I think that is, I, I think that's so, so important. And you can be both uh, optimistic, but also realistic. I think that uh, yes. there are challenges, which I think is yes. really important. Absolutely. Um, Phil, I'm so grateful um, that you would take the time. I, I just have sort of one um, final, or sorry, two final questions for you, if that's okay. Um, the first one is, what do you want your legacy to be in education? Because at some point, um, you are going to hand over that chair to somebody else. Um, it may not seem like a reality now, but at some point that will come. Um, what do you hope um, that you'll be remembered for the impact that you've had on your wonderful school? Yeah, it's such a great question, Matt. Um, I think personal attributes. I, I want people, first of all, I love associating with people who uh, have a sense of humour. And uh, we've got a lot of people here who have a sense of humour. So I I want to be known as someone who at least has a sense of humour because I think it's incredibly underrated in our job. Yeah. Um, someone who has worked with courage, with vision and with integrity yeah. um, and with honesty and someone who has been driven, unre- you know, been absolutely relentlessly driven mm-hmm. by a desire to want to do what's in the best interest of the kids. Yeah. Educationally, um, psychologically, you know, emotionally, socially, that's what gets me going every morning to wake up and think, you know, when we have meetings here, I'll often say, stop the meeting and I just say, when we're talking, should we do this? Should we do that? Is it in the best interest of the kids? Yeah, wow. And, and it, you come back to that as a C point for conversation. Um, so I want to be known for those personal attributes I said, but I also feel that, you know, I want to be known for someone who really was there for the kids. Amazing. Amazing. That's such a, it's such a wonderful place, I think, to, to start to draw our discussion to a close, because I think we, we've covered so much. But at the end of the day, um, with the complexity of the role, the, the messiness, if you like, of change, the most important thing is to keep our focus on the children. I think that's yeah. definitely really, really wonderful, Phil. And um, I can imagine that, the more complex your job gets, at times the temptation is to move away from that, but constantly refocus on what is the best interest for our children and our students, I think is so important. Um, Phil, just uh, one more question. Um, what currently has your uh, attention? What are you um, either reading or what are you? Tr- what problem are you trying to work out at the moment? Um, just before I answer that, Matt, I just wanna you know, thank you very much for this opportunity because if I can relate something to the last question, what one of the qualities that I think that principals have is our ability to listen, truly listen, mm. deeply listen. And we don't get the opportunity to talk and you've given me that opportunity. So thank you very much for that opportunity because most of my day, and this is what I truly love doing is listening to my colleagues, mm. you know, and I think it's incredibly important to be a good listener. What I turn my attention to most, to be honest with you, Matt, is I am, deeply concerned and let me come back to the Stockdale paradox but I'm deeply concerned about climate change and I'm deeply concerned about the political inertia and this country's response to it Mm -hmm. I'm a political creature at heart I love politics but I'm really appalled the way in which this country is not responding to the challenge creatively and constructively Um, and I think I therefore just look at ways in which I can make a difference myself. Wow. I think you start at the local level um, and then build up from there. You know, we, we're installing some solar panels. For, you know, we've already got some, but we're installing even more. It gives me great pleasure, to be honest with you. You know, I just, right. I, I think that's a huge challenge for humanity and for our students. Yeah, fantastic. And I think uh, raising awareness with the next generation of, of, uh, of, of, of young people I think is really important because at some point these people that are in our care grow up and they uh, 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 continue to contribute to society so I think making sure that making them aware of those issues is is more important now than it ever has been but 
Um, uh, Phil, I, I can't thank you enough, honestly, for your time. I know that you've got a, um, I would imagine you've got quite a jam-packed day. It is school holidays, but like you said, school holidays are for kids, uh, not for uh, not for teachers. So um, my hope is that people that are listening to this podcast would, whether they be on their commute to work or, or going for a walk, that they would really get something out of our discussion today. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time. And um, yeah, I really do appreciate everything, everything that you're doing to uh, to shape uh, your wonderful school and also to be part of that broader conversation around education. So uh, thank you so much. Well, Matt, you're a legend and uh, thank you for all you are doing to help us examine the profession. I think what you're doing is tremendous. Great work, mate. Well done. Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. Bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussion. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. I've one favour to ask. If you could please head to the iTunes page of the podcast and rate and review the episode. This would really help to get the interviews and resources to as many people as possible. Also, I've created a private Facebook group so that we can continue the discussion after each episode. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and until next time.